Okay. Now we are looking at uh, a second example and uh, the second example is also a big challenge of humanity. So um, the movement of the planets, it took us really uh, many hundreds of years to get it right and probably also for the inner workings of the brain it will need us um, some more years to get it right uh, and also uh, this can be tackled with automatic differentiation. So what ties these two scientific problems of humanity together is we can use automatic differentiation on them. But first of all, uh, let's have a small look back for the uh, neural networks. Um, how did they originate? Well, obviously they originated in nature, um, and, but uh, for, for the scientific community, the first people to describe them were Golgi and uh, Ramon y Cajal, uh, two Spanish uh, researchers who uh, found out that with a certain uh, coloring they could stain tissue samples from the nervous system and from the brain so that the neurons and the synapses uh, suddenly became visible in the microscopes. So as usual, as soon as we can observe a phenomenon, we can also describe it and they were the first uh, that were able to describe neurons and this then kicked off uh, a whole um, scientific discipline. And um, well, Waldeyer, a German researcher, he actually didn't discover anything but he popularized, um, he, he, he used his prominence in the scientific community to popularize the findings of Golgi and Ramon Cajal and uh, both of them uh, together won the Nobel Prize in, in 1906 and there is a, a nice Nobel lecture you can go read by Ramon Cajal about the discovery of, of, of the neurons. So the neurons are not standalone, they are connected via synapses that uh, transmit signals between the neurons and then uh, we have like sparks where the neurons are firing and uh, so this was originally described by Sherrington in the end of the 19th century as well uh, but it took quite a long time to discover how the brain was learning. So we always knew that the brain was learning, we are doing this even at university and uh, children start with this really early on and uh, the, the theory uh, that uh, is, is commonly used today is, 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 is from HEP, it's called Hepian learning, that says that synapses that, um, that fire together wire together, meaning uh, if synapses are activating at the same time they have the tendency to build uh, up synapses between them and then if synapses are used often and more often um, then they will get stronger and the connection between these neurons then will also get more and more intense. So Hebbian learning is, is the biological explanation for, for how the brain of the human and the animal is working and in learning. And um, as soon as computers came up we tried to replicate that. So artificial neural networks came up in the 40s with Pitts and McCulloch working on them and um, they described every neuron as a mathematical function that had two states, either 0 or 1, uh, so either firing or not firing, depending on the input that this neuron is receiving. And uh, originally they considered excitation inputs and inhibition inputs, um, so the difference is if any inhibition input is active then the neuron will, will stop. Um, and for the excitation input they need to reach a certain threshold and they called it theta. So the, the, the sum of the excitations needs to be larger than theta and then the neural will activate and will fire again. Um, what is important here for Meccaro and Pitts they considered only binary signals. Yeah? So here the inputs x and y uh, those were vectors with exclusively binary inputs. So everything was either 0 or was 1. And um, but pretty soon, um, so 15 years later, roundabout, uh, people invented a perceptron and uh, for the perceptron it takes uh, real numbers as input and then is uh, building up um, a weighted sum also of the inputs 
So with some weight vector w, and then again, if the input is large enough, is bigger than some threshold, then the neuron will activate. So here, the input, it can be a real number. However, the output of the neuron will be binary. So the, the, there's like an, um, a jump, uh, and the activation function is discrete, so it's either 0 or 1. And um, um, so back then people were also interested in uh, how the brain interacts with its environment. So which are the signals sent out to the muscles and which are the signals received from, from, the, from the sensors. So the sensors of the animals and the humans are, are, for example, the eyes. There's a very famous paper, what the frog's eye tells the frog's brain. And uh, Michalo and Pitts were also uh, co-authors of this paper and uh, they discovered that a lot of pre-processing is already done in the eye of the frog so uh, that it can have really fast uh, reactions to catch, um, to catch a fly that is, that is flying by the frog so that he can like, catch it with his tongue and stuff like that. And, um, and they discovered that it's not just the raw signal transmitted to the brain, but there's pre-processing already happening directly after the retina. And you have to imagine back in the day, they were literally laughed out of the room. So people did not believe them and they had to go and individually show the experiments they did in order to, to, uh, to be accepted. Um, and um, around the same time at Cornell, uh, people who were working at the Perceptron, they already built a first Perceptron and they had um, um, uh, photo diodes and they took as input uh, 20 times 20 images. So they had already 400 pixels as input. And um, if you zoom in uh, to this image, you see a lot of cables. So everything was um, analog. Uh, more or less, and they had potentiometers to, 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 to change the weights and so on. But they were already working in the 50s on object detection based on neural networks or perceptrons, as they were called at the time. Uh, everything stopped, everything ground to a halt in 1969 when Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert published a book that uh, showed some of the problems with perceptrons. For example, there are uh, really simple benchmark problems, for example, the XOR problem, that the perceptron cannot solve if you only consider a very small perceptron that doesn't have hidden layers. So today we have the deep neural networks, but back then um, they were only looking at uh, single layer perceptrons and they could show that these single layer perceptrons are really uh, weak and uh, some, some benchmark problems cannot be solved by them. They were even pessimistic about multilayer perceptrons. So today we know um, um, that, that deep neural networks work really well, but back in the day they were pessimistic about them. And uh, well, they basically stopped research into neural networks for quite a few years. And um, there was also like a fight between scientific communities and uh, Minsky and Papert, <coughs> they rather belonged to the people who wanted to do symbolic AI, so to operate on symbolic representations of the world instead of sub-symbolic um, numeric representations of the world. And um, back in the day, they won out. Their book was a huge success and people then um, discarded the idea of, of neural networks and uh, the, the funding mostly went into, into the expert systems and the uh, logical reasoning systems um, of, the, of the symbolic community. Okay, but we have learned a lot since then and we have made the jump from Hebbian learning what uh, nature is doing to backpropagation. Because for the perceptrons, the big challenge was always how to train them and um, so we will see in a later lecture also how the perceptron was trained, um, but um, the, a big jump in understanding was made in the 80s when the backpropagation algorithm um, was uh, widely uh, disseminated. So people knew about it 
before, but uh, it got widely disseminated only in the 80s. And um, what uh, the, the, the core idea behind the backpropagation algorithm is to replace this um, step function of the previous um, perceptron neural networks with a continuous function. So for the perceptron it was either 0 or, or 1, so here we had a step function. And uh, obviously the step is not differentiable. And um, the, one of the breakthrough ideas was instead of the step function to use a sigmoid function. So this, the sigmoid function that you see defined here, this is a differentiable function. And by scaling the sigmoid function, we can make it look very close as uh, if it were um, a step function. But it's still differentiable. So the same idea, um, or a similar idea, um, was presented uh, with the logarithmic barriers, where I can also now scale the logarithmic barrier and make it close, look closer and closer as um, the uh, indicator function. And here it's the step function that we are approximating. So we go here from 0 to 1 with our step and uh, with our scaling we can define how, how, how hard we want to follow this step here. And um, with the sigmoid activation function um, we can get differentiable neurons and can then also couple the neurons together uh, to a larger neural network. So here we see a neural network with a green input layer. So here, green, green input layer. Uh, then we have a blue hidden layer. So hidden just means it's not connected to the input or the output. And then we have an output layer. Obviously we could have even more hidden layers. And um, we are assuming that our network is fully connected. That means between the layers, all the nodes are connected to one another and there's a weight factor that describes um, this connection here. And the, this can be described just by a matrix multiplication. So if I want to compute from the input, the green input, um, what the hidden layer receives. The only thing that I need to do here is to multiply my input vector x by a big matrix w that represents here all the connections in the fully connected layer. And on top of that we have some, um, some bias um, that uh, we are on top, adding on top of that and uh, you can think about this like the default state of the neuron or how much convincing the neuron needs in order to, to, to finally activate. Um, and um, so the output of this first hidden layer, it's just the input multiplied by our big matrix plus the vector. And then we shove the entire thing into the sigmoid function, where here the bold font sigmoid function, it represents the element-wise application of the sigmoid. Uh, so here this would then also return us a, a, a vector of, of the same dimension. And then we can repeat that for uh, the second layer again by just multiplying with a big matrix for the, for the fully connected uh, connections and, um, and, and then adding um, another vector back on top. Uh, where this B2 here would only be a, a vector with, with a single element. Okay, and um, so that's the whole magic, and these are the neural networks. Uh, there are then also different activations functions, not only the sigmoid, there are other ones that can be used as well. Uh, but basically a neural network is a big mathematical function that maps from uh, an input that could also be high dimensional to an output where the output could also be multi-dimensional. Uh, for example, if I want to have probabilities for different uh, classes in a classification problem, then I could here have multiple output neurons and each output neuron represents like the probability for a certain, for a certain uh, class to be detected. Now, we have a big mathematical function and um, we want to use that for regression or for classification. 
And uh, now for training, what we need in addition is a loss function. So you will recall the notation here. This is exactly the notation from the first and from the second lecture. So we have a, a model. The model depends on a um, parameter vector theta. In our case, the parameter uh, vector, um, it contains um, all the, the matrices and the vectors that are defining the synapses uh, of our neural network. So this model parameter vector here, it can get really large. We can have millions of parameters in here, depending on the dimensionality of, of, the, of the matrices that we are considering. Okay, but we have a model that only that depends on this, um, on this parameter vector. And now we are iterating over our data and we are computing the loss produced for every element of our data set. And this then is the loss function. And um, um, what we then want to do in order to optimize the, the model parameters is we want to do gradient steps um, with respect to um, the, the loss function derived by the model parameters. Yeah. So here we have our loss function and we are deriving our loss function um, by the, the model parameters and we get out a very high dimensional gradient. And then we take a step in the negative direction of this very high dimensional gradient. And um, in neural networks, you might have heard about this famous, uh, or we have already told you about this famous backpropagation algorithm. And the backpropagation algorithm, it actually boils down to just automatic differentiation. So what we do today is when we encounter a neural network, or also in, in TensorFlow, when we have uh, like the graph representation of our, of our neural network, we will use reverse mode automatic differentiation to get this gradient uh, with respect to the model parameters. And, um, and then we just repeatedly do the gradient descent step and over time improve our model parameters um, uh, to get to a well-trained model that uh, can perform like the classification task that we are asking it or, or similarly. So, long story short, we have a lot. We have a lot of history from the 1940s until today. So already 80 years of, of history, nearly. And, uh, and today we can boil it down to something really simple. And actually, it fits on uh, a single slide, which we will see in in a couple of minutes. Um, but we need to fill up our bag of tricks a little more. So we need some additional back of tricks and the most important one is called stochastic gradient descent. So for the, uh, for the optimization of the trajectory of the rocket, there we could uh, just um, do a grid search and afterwards improve the solutions from our grid search by an additional gradient descent. For the neural networks, this would be a lot more complicated because when we have millions of parameters um, and we are in a million dimensional space, we can completely forget doing grid search. So we are optimizing a very non-convex function and this then poses a problem because um, in such a highly non-convex function, we will quickly get stuck in a solution that is not so good. So we will um, do gradient descent steps uh, and end up in a local minima or end up in a saddle point where the gradient is zero. And um, uh, so for, for many years people have tried that and got stuck in, in local minima who couldn't perform very well. Um, so we see here from a, a recent publication um, a plot of a typical loss function of a neural network. Um, uh, well, this is now projected on, on a 3D space so it, that it can be plotted. Um, but you see already in, in 3D space that this is highly non-convex. It has many peaks and valleys and it also has a very sharp minimum. Uh, so the minimum here is really sharp. 
and um, if we um, start with a slightly different random initial point, uh, we might miss this very sharp minimum. Yeah? And so we need to apply a lot of tricks to, to find that. The second order methods aren't very helpful either, because the, the Newton method, it, it seeks settle points. So the Newton method, it loves settle points and it wants to get close to them, but we want to escape the settle points. Yeah? We want to find the minimum and we have many settle points we're not interested in. And also, the Newton method, it requires us to compute the Hessian and when we have a million model parameters, then the Hessian would have a million times a million entries and it's just computationally unfeasible uh, or uneconomical to, to, to use second order methods therefore for the neural network. But there are ways to, to improve and um, to find better solutions, but also at the same time to avoid overfitting. So overfitting in neural networks is a huge problem because if we have millions of parameters in our model, then in some cases we could just learn the training data by heart. And then like a parrot who repeats the sentence without understanding it, the neural network could on the training data just repeat um, a learned uh, answer back without actually generalizing. And therefore overfitting is also a problem in neural networks, but there are techniques uh, that at the same time help us find better solutions. So get to uh, a lower uh, loss and also to avoid overfitting. And the most important one is called stochastic gradient descent. So what we do in stochastic gradient descent or SGD is that we uh, randomly vary the loss function between iterations of training steps. So we repeat the training many times and every time we take a slightly different loss function into consideration and we do that by depending different subsets of the training data and these are called the mini batches. So the SGD algorithm is also spelled out here on the right hand side. It takes as input the, 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 the neural network or the model in, in its uh, general form, as well as the training data, some initial uh, model parameterization. Then we have a learning rate eta, we have um, a batch size beta, and we have a number of training iterations kmx that uh, we, want to, we want to use. And what we then do is in every iteration, we choose randomly a subset from our training data of size beta and uh, use that to compute the gradient. Yeah? So the gradient obviously depends on the training data I'm using. And every time I'm choosing a different set uh, of, of, of elements um, and uh, therefore get uh, perturbations or random changes on my on my gradient, but in expectation, I will still have the, the, the correct loss function. And this helps me to get out of uh, local minima. It helps me to get around settle points. And I'm like wiggling my way through this loss function and getting closer and closer to, to, to a good solution. So this is stochastic gradient descent. And then there are additional tricks, uh, for example, uh, even if I don't have the Hessian, I can improve on simple um, gradient descent. I can uh, consider something called momentum. And uh, here we also encounter Nesterov. So the famous Nesterov who came, who, who, who worked and improved the barrier method the, for, for, for the interior point approaches. So the same Nesterov now also turns out to be hugely influential and important for the neural networks. Um, by his ideas of, of momentum um, of uh, gradient descent or in combination with gradient descent. And last but not least, dropout. So by randomly disample, uh, disabling some neurons, I can also change the, uh, the topology uh, or the loss function uh, from one training iteration to the next. And this is then also helping me in converging and in, in, in avoiding overfitting. Okay, so this was a lot of explanation, but um, what can we do with this?
um, we can we can approximate um, just continuous mathematical functions, but we can also do more interesting things. For example, um, we can uh, detect handwritten characters on an image. This was a very famous application by Jan Le Kuhn, who worked on this in the 80s when he was still working at at and in, um, uh, in the United States. And uh, they uh, came up with the idea of convolutional neural networks. We're not going into details today, uh, um, but uh, this, reduced it, this reduced the number of model parameters necessary um, when working with, with image data. And uh, today this uh, MNIST data set that uh, Jan Lekun also had creating is uh, essentially solved. So with today's uh, computers, we don't have much difficulty in, in, in solving uh, the, the MNIST task. So much more goes into a full featured character, optical character recognition engine, before, because first I need to know where there is a certain character before I can classify it. First I have to like the, draw the boundaries around each character. Uh, but this um, um, recognition of characters with a neural network, it's like the inner 5% of, of, uh, of such an optical character recognition engine. There are different approaches uh, not using neural networks, but uh, this is one that, that proved very, very successful. And in the exercises, actually, we intend to, to build an MNIST solver from scratch by just using automatic differentiation as a technique and, uh, and nothing else. Okay, but first let's look at uh, how we can uh, use neural networks with automatic differentiation. First, we are defining uh, some additional functions that we need. So here the sigmoid function, um, the sigmoid function up here, and then the softmax function. This guy here is important uh, for training of classifiers with neural networks. Uh, we will see a little bit more detail on that in the exercise because this is already getting long. Um, and uh, then we have a, a neural network. And this here, these maybe 15 lines of code. And this is the entire neural network that can be used to classify uh, MNIST characters. So what we take here as input is we have our theta, theta the, um, the vector with all the uh, parameters of the neural network, as well as the image. And this image here then is a, is a um, a 20 times 28 matrix, um, but uh, we then reshape that uh, so that it is only a vector. Um, the theta vector is also reshaped. So first we extract our first matrix W1, if you remember that from the formula, as well as the vector B1. And uh, then we can define the mathematical function for the first layer. And we do that also for the second and for the third layer. And then we can just plug them um, one into the other. And in 15 lines of code, I here have defined a neural network, rather simple one with um, fully connected layers. But this is a full featured neural network. And this is actually enough to solve to some degree the MNIST classification task. And what is cool here now that I can just um, then use automatic differentiation to uh, get the gradient of my neural network and the loss function for stochastic gradient descent with respect to the model parameters. And I, and I can use that for training to, um, to improve the parameters. So what you see here on this one single slide, including the loading of the MNIST data, is, uh, is sufficient to, uh, to, to solve MNIST. And this goes to show you some of the power of automatic differentiation. It simplifies a lot. And it also allows us to differentiate entire algorithms. So if I have a very complex simulation, um, it might not be feasible to uh, mathematically uh, define a derivative. But with automatic differentiation, I don't even have to change my code. I can just use the dual numbers and get the gradient that way. So 
what did we learn today? In summary, we saw automatic differentiation. How can we get derivatives without doing the math? And uh, how can we implement that um, by uh, using operator overloading? Here we saw that in the Julia language, it would also work in, in, in C++. And there are also packages in, in Python that provide this functionality. However, with the dual numbers, we have to be careful if we are uh, having complicated control flows in our um, algorithms that we differentiate because there might be edge cases in, in the case distinctions uh, where there is actually no derivative but the dual numbers will give us one result anyhow depending on the actual path that we took in, in the control flow. Okay, And then we used automatic differentiation to optimize two different examples for highly non-convex functions and we had to introduce additional bags of tricks in order to get to good solutions. So for the uh, space mission planning from to Mars and back from Mars, we had to do domain grid scanning and then a gradient descent uh, based on these uh, initial starting points. And um, uh, the other idea was, uh, for the neural network was to use stochastic gradient descent, so to randomly perturb our uh, target function, our loss function, uh, in order to get around um, saddle points and out of local minima. And uh, we saw that backpropagation, so the training algorithm for neural networks is actually just an uh, application of, of reverse mode automatic differentiation. Um, this concludes the lecture of today and uh, I hope you are convinced that this will increase your um, uh, toolbox uh, by uh, something very useful if you are working in machine learning in the future or if you are staying in an engineering domain in the future uh, because um, it, uh, it removes the need for mathematical uh, derivatives and oftentimes we either don't have them or we are a little bit lazy and now we can derive everything, any algorithm, we just have to be a little bit um, careful with the edge cases. That's it for today and uh, see you next week with lecture 7 which will be on vector spaces. Until then, bye.